Welcome everybody to another McLean Hospital Grand Rounds. <clears throat> it's really uh, my pleasure to introduce one of our own today, Dr. Penny Hallett. Um, uh, for those of you who need continuing education credit, instructions are in the chat function. So if you just look at that, the code for today is 545. So if you text that into the Cloud CME system, you will be registered for today grand, today's Grand Rounds. So, Dr. Hallett is an assistant professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School and co-director of the Neuroregeneration Institute at McLean Hospital. She received her PhD from the University of Manchester in the United Kingdom and performed her postdoctoral studies at Mass General Hospital. In 2006, she came to McLean Hospital to join the Neuroregeneration Institute that was founded by Dr. Ole Isaacson in 1989 and is co-led by Drs. Hallett and, Al uh, and Isaacson. Her work is dedicated to understanding early, early neuronal dysfunction and degeneration in neurodegenerative diseases and in aging, and testing therapeutic interventions aimed at both vulnerable neurons and replacing those destroyed by disease. From 2007 to 2009, she was deputy associate editor of the European Journal of Neuroscience, and she served as an editor for molecular and cellular neuroscience from 2009 to 17, and I am going to turn the grand rounds over today uh, to her today. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. And yeah, I'm really delighted to have this opportunity to present today and thank Kerry and Chris um, for this opportunity and uh, to present our program in the NRI of this autologous IPSC-based cell therapy uh, for Parkinson's disease. And um, I'm excited on behalf of both myself and, and Ola Isaacson and of course, all of our team in the New Regeneration Institute, because um, as you'll see, uh, this is really a huge team effort that has really spanned over um, several decades um, to get to where we are now. Um, and um, yeah, I'm going to sort of present this translational story uh, to you of from our discovery work and proof of concept work um, uh, to where we are now with our planned human clinical trials. So. Uh, so just as a brief outline of what I'd like to cover today, uh, so I'll talk to you about the uh, rationale for using cell therapy, which is really a completely new modality uh, therapy for Parkinson's disease. And I will show to you um, some of the highlights of using cell replacement therapy in Parkinson's disease uh, with our experiences of using fetal dopamine neuron replacement in Parkinson's disease. And then I'd really like to outline to you as well how this uh, therapeutic modality is really a replacement of synapses and restoration of circuitry in the brain uh, using the dopamine neuron replacement and how different this is to uh, a pharmacological treatment or other therapies in, Parkins uh, par in Parkinson's disease. And then outline to you our, our experiences of using stem cells uh, to generate dopaminergic neurons for transplantation and this new technology now of using uh, of, of achieving autologous transplantation using induced pluripotent stem cells as a source of the midbrain dopaminergic neurons. And then finally, of course, outline the clinical trials uh, that are planned now by our team. So as a brief introduction into Parkinson's disease, so Parkinson's disease, uh, the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease are caused by the selective loss of these midbrain dopaminergic neurons in the substantia nigra, which project up, project up to the caudation putamen or the striatum in the brain. And so the uh, mainstay treatment for Parkinson's disease is to actually replace the dopamine that's lost Caused by, uh, caused by the death of these dopaminergic neurons. And so the mainstay treatment uh, was first described in the 1960s and is still the main treatment for uh, even today. And this is using pharmacological replacement with levodopa. And um, also, uh, of course, now we use uh, dopamine agonists as well. So this uh, extracellular replacement of the levodopa works very well for a number of years in patients, but of, uh, over, over time, this pharmacological treatment can lead to severe uh, levodopa-induced dyskinesias. And so rescue treatment has been uh, developed and is used in patients uh, called deep brain stimulation or DBS, but this is really targeted, um, as I'll describe shortly, uh, against the, dis the levodopa dyskinesias themselves. 
So in order to actually achieve a physiological dopamine release in the brain in patients, the only way to really do this is to actually implant new midbrain dopaminergic neurons into the brain. And so that's what we're doing with our cell therapy paradigms. And as I show you, this has been shown in, in both in vivo systems from rodents, non-human primates, as well as using fetal cell transplantation in humans uh, to, to um, re help restore movement and reduce dyskinesias in the patients. So the dopamine system, the striatal dopamine system has a remarkable capacity to be able to compensate over time. And so when patients, this is uh, illustrating here that the number of synapses left in the brain and the, in the striatum over time uh, using a quantitative dopamine transporter scanning. And so when patients present to the clinic, they've actually already lost around 67 to 70% of their dopaminergic neurons. And that's when the, this kind of threshold, so to speak, uh, is reached and the patients then present with the motor symptoms to the clinic. So of course, by the, if this many dopaminergic neurons have been lost, this doesn't uh, allow for neuroprotection therapies at this late stage. And so being able to transplant the cells back into the brain um, at this symptomatic stage allows us to uh, cross back over this threshold and be able to, uh, to restore uh, dopaminergic transmission in the striatum and then be able to um, achieve uh, um, uh, symptomatic benefits or uh, motor, motor benefits in the patients. Uh, but let me show you um, in the next few uh, schematics how these dopaminergic neuron transplants work. So this drawing here is actually represents one single spine in a medium spiny uh, striatal uh, uh, dopaminergic neuron. So these are the do uh, uh, sorry medium spiny striatal neuron. So these are the neurons that are uh, that receive the transmission or the synaptic uh, um, connections from the dop the nigrostriatal dopaminergic neurons. Uh, and the, the uh, signaling of these neurons is very tightly regulated. So they receive inputs, of course, as I said, from the dopaminergic nigrostriatal neurons, but also from glutamatergic uh, neurons from the cortex and serotonergic neurons as well. And so uh, the dopaminergic transmission in the normal brain is very tightly regulated. So dopamine that's released from the synapse is quickly taken back up into the dopaminergic presynaptic terminal through these dopamine transporters. And so this, uh, all this um, signaling together allows for regulated signaling of these medium spiny neurons and uh, normal movement in people. So what happens in Parkinson's disease? So then these dopaminergic neurons, the majority of these dopaminergic neurons are now lost. And this creates uh, the postsynaptic, means that the postsynaptic dopamine receptors in this, on the medium spiny neurons become very supersensitive uh, because their normal dopaminergic transmission is now gone. And so the remaining, um, uh, we have very few remaining dopaminergic uh, terminals uh, left. And also we get a dysregulated signaling knock-on effect also from the glutamatergic synapses. And so altogether, this means that we have this um, dysregulated signaling of these striatal neurons, which creates the Parkinson's disease motor symptoms. So as I mentioned before, the mainstay treatment for Parkinson's disease is uh, levodopa. And so levodopa is uh, taken systemically. Uh, it crosses the blood-brain barrier where it's then converted into dopamine. Uh, of course, it's converted into dopamine in the main in the remaining dopaminergic terminals, but also because these are so uh, few and far between in the Parkinson's brain, uh, the the um, uh, serotonergic term, uh, terminals also have the machinery to, machinery to break down levodopa and convert it into dopamine. But of course, they lack the dopamine transporter to be able to actually have a regulated dopamine release. So what happens is the dopamine spills out over the synapse, uh, can hit then these super sensitive dopamine receptors. And over time, this continued sort of pulsatile dopamine um, uh, exogenous dopamine uh, transmission uh, then creates the symptoms of the levodopa-induced dyskinesias. And in these medium spiny neurons, there's a number of downstream effects that we can look at and that we can measure uh, that really is reflective then of the of the actual um, whole circuitry of the basal ganglia. And these include changes in um, uh, pro, pre -pro, uh, molecules such as preproencephalin A, uh, B, as well as looking at the changes in the dopamine receptors themselves and other downstream enzymes. 
So then with the cell replacement, what we're doing is actually putting new dopaminergic neurons back into the denervated striatum of the Parkinson's brain. And so that's illustrated here by these transplanted uh, dopaminergic neurons here. And these uh, these new synapses form in nearly the same place as uh, on the medium spiny neuron as from where the um, original dopaminergic synapses were lost. And so now the uh, striatum has the correct machinery, machinery to be able to uh, release and reuptake dopamine um, normally again. And so uh, the patients can, or, or, um, this means that the dose of levodopa can be reduced and in some cases it's completely eliminated altogether. And now we have again regulated signaling of the medium spiny neurons. And we again, we can actually measure these downstream effects, as I'll show you in some slides later on, and uh, see that these are now normalized with the cell, um, with the cell replacement. So we believe that this cell therapy approach, and in particular our approach for using the autologous transplantation, will really provide a one-time cell therapy that can actually cure or stop the movement disorder of Parkinson's disease. So then in this next schematic, uh, what I'd like to just show you is how the cell uh, replacement um, compares to other uh, currently available or, or being tested um, treatments for Parkinson's disease. So again, uh, in the in the schematic here in the top, we have the um, dopaminergic uh, synapse with the medium spiny neuron in the, in the normal brain. Uh, so here we have the normal uh, regulated signaling between the dopaminergic um, synapses and the medium spiny neurons, which allows for movement. And in Parkinson's disease, this is now lost. Uh, so again, here there's these super sensitive dopamine uh, receptors. And so in terms of the current and available uh, or current and experimental treatments for Parkinson's disease, as I mentioned before, uh, here we've illustrated levodopa and dopaminergic agonists, which is really just um, a way of exogenous, exogenously um, uh, um, replacing the dopamine or stimulating these dopaminergic receptors. Uh, and over time, of course, as I mentioned, cause these levodopa-induced dyskinesias. The deep brain stimulation um, can work well in patients uh, against the levodopa dyskinesias themselves um, for, so for some time. Uh, but again, also has its own, uh, this treatment modality also has its own um, uh, limitations as well. And then there are several gene therapy trials that have been tested uh, currently. Uh, but again, this, this really is just replacing the enzymes that are needed for um, making dopamine. And, and actually is expressed in these striatal, the gene therapy is expressed in these striatal uh, neurons. So none of these treatments actually um, address replacing the synapses themselves in the brain. And so the only way to do this is to use the um, this novel modality using the cell therapy, uh, cell therapy approach. And so what we know um, on the data I'll show you from using fetal cell transplantation is that replacing these dopaminergic neurons into the brain can actually provide sustained improvement in patients for the motor symptoms for over 10 uh, 10 years and really allows uh, um, a normalized biofeedback bio in the striatum by replacing these dopaminergic uh, synapses. So our team uh, in the neurogeneration, which has really been led by Ola Isaacson's um, pioneering work over several decades, uh, really has a long history in the cell therapy field. And so in this timeline, I've here I've illustrated some of our key studies uh, in green, which have really built, built the groundwork for where we are now. And so these include studies that show that embryonic stem cell biology can be used to innovatively create midbrain dopaminergic neurons. Uh, as well as showing that dopaminergic neurons from embryonic stem cells can provide functional recovery in a um, Parkinson's disease animal model. And I'll show you some, um, a slide on this. Uh, in 2008, our team collaborated with Rudy Enish, whose group at MIT to show for the first time that mouse induced pluripotent stem cells uh, could be differentiated into functional dopaminergic neurons and provide a functional recovery in a rodent PD model. Uh, this was also followed by a uh, work from our team showing that uh, human-induced pluripotent stem cells could be differentiated into functional dopaminergic neurons. And then our work in 2015 uh, that is sort of brings us closer to where we are now of really testing this autologous approach of using induced pluripotent stem cells in a non-human primate model. 
And our team also has a long history um, of using fetal cell transplantation as well, uh, um, uh, both testing in animal models of Parkinson's disease, as well as collaborations uh, to test this also in the clinic in patients. And I'll show you some of that, uh, show you some of that data. So just before I get to these data, I just want to uh, sort of show you early on uh, where we are now. So our team was recently awarded um, a, a NIH, uh, NINDS, an NINDS uh, award of $9 million to uh, be able to perform IND enabling studies and then do a systemic anal systematic analysis of testing this autologous transplantation approach uh, into, into six Parkinson's disease patients. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that um, later. But just to show you here now, uh, this is to show illustrate the steps we are taking to make the dopaminergic neurons um, for this program. And so what we will do or what we are doing is taking blood from patients with Parkinson's disease. Uh, we isolate the um, blood cells. We isolate a fraction of the um, peripheral blood mononuclear cells and the T cells, which are then uh, reprogrammed. Um, we have several uh, quality control steps along this way. Uh, but basically what this achieves is that we um, end up with, um, we use our uh, Midbrain dopaminergic neuron differentiation protocol uh, that we've developed in the in the NR, in the Neurogeneration Institute. Uh, but uh, so from each patient, we then end up with multiple batches of frozen thawed midbrain dopaminergic neurons that are all quality control tested, uh, and these are then used for autologous transplantation into the putamen or the striatum of the Parkinson's disease. Um, of the Parkinson's disease patient. And so the number of cells that we need for this uh, for this procedure uh, and from each individual um, patient is easily scalable. So this is where we are uh, right now. Um, but now to start telling, showing you some of the clinical proof of concept data that we uh, have um, for using the cell therapy paradigms in Parkinson's disease. So first of all, this is using fetal, fetal midbrain dopaminergic neurons. So this is in collaboration. We've collaborated for a long time uh, with um, Dr. Eva Mendez, who's a neurosurgeon in Saskatchewan in Canada. Um, and we've collaborated with him for the last uh, 15 years or so. And Dr. Mendez has really been um, pioneering in the fetal um, dopamine neuron transplantation method methodology and for Parkinson's disease. And so here I'd like to show you a video shared with us um, by Dr. Mendez um, that's going to show you a Parkinson's disease patient um, before and then after um, transplantation. So this is a uh, patient, uh, so here on the left is pre-transplantation and then at 10 years after the fetal cell transplantation therapy. So this patient is off all of his levodopa or dopamine agonist drugs when these videos were taken so that you can really see the, um, hopefully the difference that this fetal cell transplantation can make in these patients. So these kind of uh, data really provide the inspiration of what we're doing now. And um, but this fetal cell transplantation, this I sh showed you here uh, in the video, is ten years after uh, transplantation. Uh, but in fact, cell replacement in in Parkinson's disease can really provide sustained motor improvements for over 20 years um, post-transplantation. And so as demonstrated here in this work, uh, this is um, from a study in, in Europe using fetal cell transplantation. And this is one page showing you one patient uh, with Parkinson's disease um, up to 16 years after transplantation at, at this group of now sh um, shown that the, um, the that this fetal cell transplantation is still uh, eff efficacious over 20 years after transplantation. Uh, but what we see is this really sustained motor improvements after transplant after the fetal cell transplantation. So that's shown here in this white line um, over time. Um, so this is the UPDRS motor score in this patient. And so a reduction in the motor score actually signifies an improvement in the Parkinson's motor symptoms. And this reduction in the in the motors in the motor score, so improvement in symptoms was um, 
uh, paralleled by an increase in dopaminergic transmission in the striatum as um, measured by PET scans for fluoridopa. And so in this patient, as is the case with many patients receiving the fetal cell transplantation, pharmacological dopaminergic therapy uh, can be discontinued. And not only are the cell, um, is the cell replacement effective against the Parkinson's motor, motor symptoms, but it's also effective against the levodopa-induced dyskinesias um, also in these patients. So this next slide shows you PET neuroimaging data and postmortem um, uh, immunostaining data from patients again receiving fetal dopaminergic neuron uh, transplantation. So this is work that we did in collaboration with Dr. Eva Mendes. And uh, so just as an example here, here is a fluoridopa PET scan uh, in a patient before, uh, with Parkinson's disease before transplantation, and then at six years after transplantation. So you can see the significant increase in the um, af after bilateral transplantation into the striatum, this increase in the um, dopamine uptake in the brain. Uh, and then at postmortem, um, we see a robust labeling of the dopaminergic neurons um, in, the, in the transplanted striatum, as shown here. You can actually see the needle tract where the cells are implanted. And then this, uh, this is labeling for dopaminergic neurons here. And you can see this re, re um, provided by the transplanted dopaminergic neurons into the brain. And here at a slightly higher magnification, you can really see all of these individual uh, new uh, dopaminergic neurons that were transplanted into the brain. So one question uh, that has <clears throat> come up in the in the uh, transplantation field in Parkinson's disease is whether the transplanted cells will become eventually affected by the same uh, pathological processes that are present in the host brain in Parkinson's disease. And there have been reports over the years of a very, very low percentage of uh, the dopaminergic neurons that have been implanted um, containing um, Parkinson's disease-like pathology uh, at a long time after transplantation. So we're talking a decade after transplantation. But it's really important to note that this percentage is very low. It's about one to two, in the in the cases where it has been reported is around one to 2% of the total number of dopaminergic uh, remaining dopaminergic uh, transplanted neurons and most importantly it doesn't see, it doesn't affect the function of the of the graft and in fact the presence of the pathology also seems to be dependent on the method of the transplantation used so um, here again this is work in collaboration with Eva Mendes um, sewing three uh, um, labeling for, this is called alpha synuclein, this is a marker of the pathology, of Parkinson's-like pathology in the graft. Um, in, this is in three patients who had received fetal cell transplantation, but this methodology is using a cell, uh, what we call a cell suspension of the dopaminergic neurons, and our work, um, as well as that of others, has shown that the presence of this pathology, if it's there, is, is, is uh, linked to the um, methodology used. So in this cell suspension, graphs we see no um no none of this alpha of this pa parkinson's like um, pathology whereas other um earlier types of um, fetal cell transplantation methodologies that we used um which we know increase the immunogenicity of those transplanted cells those um those graphs seem to be associated with a slightly um a higher presence of the pathology uh but yeah, as I, as I said, in these uh, cell suspension grafts, um, uh, in collaboration with, uh, with Dr. Mendez, we really found that there was no um, Parkinson's pathology at a, after 10 years after, longer than 10 years after transplantation, as shown here. So we've uh, we continue to look at the to investigate the long term health and the function of the transplanted fetal dopaminergic neurons in the Parkinson's disease brain, and so this was another study that we published on um, again uh, in collaboration with uh, our team with Dr. Mendez. And so here we were looking after transplantation. Um, in the patient brain after fetal cell transplantation, we were actually we were looking at labeling of the dopamine transporters, which are present, uh, as I showed you earlier, um, presynaptically on those um, implanted dopaminergic neurons. And so, by seeing the presence of the dopamine transporter, we know that those those uh, transplanted fetal cells are, are still functional and um, expressing the correct machine machinery. 
Um, and so this is showing you two patients uh, after transplantation. So labeling for this dopamine transporter in green, um, and then these red cells are the actual dopaminergic neurons them themselves. And what we see here is that uh, even at a short time point, shorter time point of four years after transplantation, but again, over a decade after transplantation, we really see this robust dopamine transporter labeling in the, that's completely re-innovating the transplanted abstraatum in these patients. And so this really um, uh, signifies that the these grafts, these transplanted neurons um, uh, stay healthy and function for a, for a long time after transplantation. So as I showed you earlier in the in the schematics the, that I showed you, the dopamine neuron transplantation really enables us to achieve synaptic dopamine release and biofeedback um, in the brain, which is a very different mechanism than the pharmacological um, replacement of dopamine uh, using levodopa or dopamine dopaminergic agonists. And so in the next few slides, I'd like to show you um, some of the experimental evidence uh, for this. So as a way of testing what happens uh, if the transplanted fetal cells um, have an elevated and controlled dopamine release, um, we, what we did is we transplanted fetal dop mouse dopaminergic neurons from wild type mice, uh, as well as from mice that actually lack the dopamine transporter uh, into a rat model of Parkinson's disease. Um, and actually a rat model of uh, levodopa-induced disc uh, levodopa dyskinesia also. And so this was work that we published um, in 2008. And so first of all, what I want to show you is that when with these um, transplanted cells from the wild type and the dopamine transporter knockout mice, because the, the dopamine transporter or DAT knockout mouse uh, transplanted neurons lack the dopamine transporter, they have a much higher uh, level of dopamine. And so this was... Um, microdialysis experiments that we uh, where we were able to actually measure the dop the extracellular dopamine levels in the striatum of these transplanted animals and what we found as we expected was that the um, dopamine um, knockout graphs had around a threefold higher uh, level of basal dopamine levels so these grafts were um, pumping out higher levels of dopamine compared to the wild type grafts and so what we wanted to see was whether if with this um, higher um, dopamine high dopamine levels that this affected the functioning of these grafts. Well, actually what we found is that it um, it actually didn't really affect the functioning of the grafts. And so actually when we measured the motor function in this um, PD, Parkinson's disease rat model, we found that both the wild type and the dopamine transporter knockout grafts improved functional responses in this rat model. And so this is shown um, uh, here in these two graphs where we're looking at the response of the of the Parkinsonian rats after transplantation uh, to um, pharmacological stimulation uh, by apomorphine and amphetamine. And so what we see with the, with a the normal functioning graft is that uh, compared to baseline when the rotational response in these animals, these animals have a unilateral lesion. So um, so the when you when you um, challenge them with say um, a dopamine agonist or um, amphetamine, the animals will will rotate um, to one side. And so we can count the number of the the number of turns that the animal makes. And so with a proper functioning graft that over time, uh, as the graft integrates, the number of rotations of that animals of the, the that animal will decrease. And so what we found was that both the animals that were transplanted with the wild type grafts as well as the DAT knock the dopamine transporter knockout grafts had a functional improvement um, on these pharmacological um, challenges. And then again, when we looked at the how well they as in, in another measurement of motor function, how well the animals um, did this, what we call a spontaneous poor reaching task. Uh, we found that both, again, both the wild type graphs and the DAT knockout graphs improved the spontaneous poor uh, reaching. So both types of graphs were, fu were functioning in this animal model. And then um, this, we also looked at the effect of these graphs on the levodopa induced dyskinesias in, the an in this animal model as well. And so even though the striatal extracellular dopamine levels 
uh, were higher, uh, as I showed you um, a couple of slides ago in the dopamine transport to knockout grafts, uh, we were actually able to see a um, reduction of the levodopa induced dyskinesias both by the wild type grafts and the dopamine transport to knockout grafts. And importantly, what we uh, also found was that even though the uh, dopamine transport to knockout grafts had again this high level higher level of um, extracellular dopamine, we didn't see any spontaneous dyskinesias induced by these grafts. And so this uh, data uh, really um, showed to us that it's it was the pres it's the presence of the dopamine terminal terminal transmission that's important and not the dopamine levels per se uh, in terms of restoring function. So just again, to come back to this schematic, um, now illustrating the difference between the wild type grafts and the dopamine transport and knockout grafts. Uh, so here, um, just briefly, when we transplant with the wild type dopaminergic neurons, we have um, uh, normal dopamine release and reuptake and a regulated signaling of, the, of these um, striatal medium spiny neurons and improvement of the Parkinson's disease uh, motor symptoms as well as levodopa induced dyskinesias. And then, uh, but then also when we have the dopaminergic, um, sorry, the dopamine transport and knockout graphs, even though we had, we measured that we had a higher extracellular dopamine levels uh, in these transplanted, um, in the tra transplanted stratum, we still saw uh, an improvement of the Parkinson's uh, motor symptoms and of the levodopa dyskinesia. Um, and also, uh, I don't, haven't shown you the data, but we also measured um, with the, after transplantation with these grafts, we measured different downstream uh, readouts in the striatum of um, changes that we know occur with, within the Parkinson's brain and levodopa and dyskinesia, levodopa and dyskinesia, and we saw that these were also normalized, both with the wild type grafts and the DAT knockout grafts. So um, again, um, what this uh, experiment really showed us that it's the um, that it's the presence of these uh, synapses that's, that's important um, and that this is really what is mediating um, uh, functional effects after transplantation. And so in terms of this replacement um, the, uh, with the dopaminergic neurons, that provides both synaptic repair as well as circuitry um, re um, repair in Parkinson's disease. And so also um, supporting the work that I just showed you, this uh, concept has been shown by other studies and other groups as well. Um, so um, very early work, um, again, showed that uh, in the same rat model, in a, uh, the same type of rat model that I just showed you, that the, these fetal mid ventral midbrain or dopaminergic graphs can induce, uh, can uh, reverse uh, downstream changes of um, striatal markers in uh, after transplantation. And also early work from um, Ulla uh, also showed that these uh, intrastriatal grafts after transplantation in vivo um, are able to auto-regulate dopaminergic releases and dopamine metabolism. Uh, the work I just showed, showed you, uh, showing you that uh, it, uh, fetal dopaminergic neurons can normalize striatal dopaminergic receptor supersensitivity and downstream striatal gene expression, even when the dopamine transporter is knocked out. And then more recent work, uh, this was an elegant study from Lawrence Studer's um, group in New York showing you showing in human embryonic stem cell derived dopaminergic neurons after they are transplanted in a rodent Parkinson's disease model. Um, they were also showed the functional connectivity of these neurons using an optogenetic approach, which meant that they were actually able to switch on and off the, dop the transplanted dopaminergic neurons. And they could see very clearly that when they when the dopaminergic neurons, transplanted dopaminergic neurons were switched on, then the animals responded and had a reduction of the Parkinson's motor symptoms, but when they uh, opt genetically stimulated the um, the transplanted dopaminergic neurons to turn them off so that they were no longer signaling those Parkinson's uh, motor symptoms and their animals um, came back again. So that was a really um, nice study to illustrate this as well. So Next, I will tell you about our work using stem cell derived neurons that has really led to now where we are using autologous induced pluripotent stem cells um, in our current work. 
So just briefly, what we aim to achieve with using stem cells is to really follow the developmental cues uh, that are present in the normal brain to generate the midbrain dopaminergic neurons. So, um, so in, in Parkinson's disease, this is showing you in a um, uh, just mapping out the different subtypes of dopaminergic neurons that are present in a, a human midbrain. And so it's these A9 dopaminergic neurons here and the substantia nigra pars compactor that are lost in Parkinson's disease. And so this is what we aim to achieve with the stem cell derived dopaminergic neurons. And so by following the developmental cues in a dish, we are able to um, uh, to generate these dopamine, midbrain dopaminergic neurons in vitro. And so we've identified uh, the different transcription factors and growth factors that, are, that occur in normal development over time um, to make these A9 dopaminergic neurons. And so we are able to apply those different factors in the dish and able to, in order to actually uh, generate this population of cells. And so we've uh, it, it's, it's kind of complicated to actually generate this specific um, type of A9 dopaminergic neuron, but we uh, in work uh, we published in 2010 really identified the particular factors uh, uh, and when those factors needed to be applied to the, to the stem cells in a dish in order to be able to make these dopaminergic neurons. And we can label the dopaminergic neurons that we with the markers that we know are important uh, for um, for the phenotype of the midbrain dopaminergic neurons so that we know that we are uh, making the correct type of cell. So since uh, 2010, we've further, we further refined this dopaminergic differentiation protocol uh, in order to make it uh, now um, clinically compatible um, um, to generate a higher number of the do midbrain dopaminergic neurons and also to be able to cryopreserve these dopaminergic neurons um, all in all to be able to improve the reproducibility of the differentiations and really eliminate com uh, components of the differentiations that would be incompatible with then using those cells uh, in the human tra in human transplantation paradigms. So, uh, but first just to um, go back a few years uh, to highlight some, again, some of our stem cell um, really how our, our stem cell work got us to where we are now. This was an earlier study um, by Ola that pr really provided the first evidence that embryonic stem cells could be used to generate functional dopaminergic neurons. So in this study by in 2002, um, Ola showed that by transplanting um, embryonic stem cells in a low number uh, directly into the brain of a, of a unilateral um, rat model, of Parkinson's disease, that those embryonic stem cells could differentiate into functional midbrain dopaminergic neurons that then, um, as, you sh as shown here, that could then restore uh, motor asymmetry in the um, Parkinsonian rat um, and, uh, uh, that, and that these cells were um, releasing dopamine and also could uh, restore actually also cortical activation in the brain as well. And so, as I said, this work really provided the first functional transplantation of dopaminergic stem cell derived uh, neurons in, um, in this Parkinson's rat model. So then next, uh, the, we moved into using induced pluripotent stem cells. And so we showed, um, uh, again, in collaboration this time with uh, Rudy Enish's group um, over at MIT, uh, so showed for the first time that induced pluripotent stem cells could be derived from uh, fibroblasts as, as using mouse fibroblasts and could be differentiated into midbrain dopaminergic neurons, as shown here. And again, that these cells could be dopaminergic neurons um, derived from the induced pluripotent stem cells could be transplanted into a rodent Parkinson's disease model um, and provide functional recovery. So then moving forward a couple of years, we then showed uh, for the first time that induced pluripotent stem cells derived from um, human uh, uh, from human patients with Parkinson's disease could be differentiated into uh, the right type of dopaminergic neurons and then transplanted again into the rodent Parkinson's disease model and that these cells survived, um, grew in the adult rodent brain and again reduced motor asymmetry in these Parkinsonian rats uh, again shown here. Um, so these are the uh, rats that were transplanted that we with the human iPS cell derived dopaminergic neurons. And again, that these cells uh, survive in the, tr in the transplanted straight and um, 
up to six, six months after transplantation. So now more recently, they, the, we're now um, using these iPS cells as an autologous transplantation approach. So the, the real advantage of using the iPS cells is that we can then take iPS cells from an individual patient and then transplant the patient's own cells back into the back into the brain. And so that's what we will be testing um, when we uh, come to do our clinical trial. So just now what I want to do is then now highlight um, in a couple of slides our work testing this autologous transplantation approach in a non-human primate model of Parkinson's disease. So here is our approach of using the iPSCs. This is the same for, um, for the autologous approach. This is the same for whether it's non-human primate that we're testing or for the, for the um, approach in the clinical trial. So we take uh, um, uh, PBO uh, blood cells, or in the case of the primate, we took fibroblasts from um, which are then reprogrammed into induced pluripotent stem cells, uh, differentiated, uh, like I showed you a few slides ago, into the midbrain, uh, ventral midbrain uh, dopaminergic neurons. Uh, in the case of the clinic, these cell suspensions are then frozen so that we can do quality control testing on the cells and then autologously transplanted back into the brain. And we expect to see, as we see, as you'll see in the uh, non-human primate work that I'll show you now, uh, a sustained improvement in clinical motor symptoms that in the patient we expect to last over decades. So for testing in the primate model of Parkinson's disease, uh, we use a primate model that's um, produced by giving the animal a drug called MPTP. Um, so systemic treatment with MPTP um, causes a permanent loss of nigrostriatal dopaminergic neurons. Um, and these, uh, this, these um, non-human primates uh, that are, are affected or treated with the, with the MPTP really show all the cardinal motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. So this includes a slowness of movement, um, uh, the reduced movement, rigidity, tremor, balance, and gait disturbances. Uh, the animals are also responsive to levodopa and uh, show levodopa-induced dyskinesias when we challenge them um, with, with repeated levodopa treatment. So this was work that we published in 2015 with this autologous transplantation approach. So here you see one animal um, uh, before it was administered or before it was made Parkinsonian and administered with a MPTP. This again is looking at the dopamine transporter scanning, the quantitative DAT scan um, using CFT. And here after um, MPTP treatment after the creation of the, the Parkinson's disease animal model, you see this loss of dopamine in the uh, in the two striatum, striatum. And then after unilateral transplantation with uh, the animal's own, uh, so autologous IPSC derived dopaminergic neurons, this is at two years after transplantation on one side of the brain. And here you can see this, in, hopefully you can see this increase in the dopamine um, uptake on the transplanted side. So this was really the first uh, um, first time anybody had shown that this autologous transplantation uh, approach could work in a non-human primate model of Parkinson's disease and provided um, um, sustained uh, dopamine uptake, uptake as well as re-innovation at two years after transplantation. And so these animals were not, or this animal was not treated with uh, any immunosuppressive therapy during this whole um, transplantation time. So here at postmortem, again, we see the survival of these transplantation of these transplanted dopaminergic neurons, uh, as well as reinnovation um, of the denervated brain. So we also measured the or looked at the functional recovery uh, in this animal after transplantation. So we saw an increase in the after transplantation of the spontaneous locomotor activity of the animal, and also using uh, an automated and objective um, way, uh, method of uh, measuring hand movements in the animal, we were able to see on the corresponding side of the animal, the corresponding hand of the animal to the transplanted side of the brain. So the animal was transplanted on the right side of the brain and we look, measured the hand movements on the left side of the brain and we saw an improvement in the Parkinson's uh, motor symptoms on this side of the brain. And so also importantly, uh, we looked 
for the presence of uh, potential presence of proliferating cells in the graft uh, and in the brain after transplantation. Uh, again, again, this is at two years after transplantation, and we saw no proliferating cells in the brain. And also using an immune cell marker, um, we saw no evidence for any neuroinflammation in the brain. And again, as I mentioned, this animal um, was autologously tra uh, transplanted and received no immune suppression. So since this work uh, was published in 2015, uh, we've um, re uh, seen an additional um, uh, Parkinsonian primates that were treated autologously with the iPS-derived dopaminergic neurons. Uh, this is showing you data in another two animals that are a year and a half after transplantation uh, that, again, we see functional improvement uh, mediated by the transplanted dopaminergic neurons and robust survival of the grafts um, at 18 months after transplantation again, with no immune suppression. Uh, this uh, transplantation paradigm of using iPSC dopaminergic neurons in this MPTP lesion monkey model uh, has also been tested by um, other groups. This is, a, uh, this is work um, from Japan actually showing you here that human iPSC derived dopaminergic neurons also function in the primate model. Uh, of course, this is, a, this is not an autologous approach in this um, primate model because we're using, they were using the human iPSC derived neurons. So these animals would have been, uh, were heavily treated with immune suppression during the course of the study, uh, but just um, really to show you that these human iPSC dopaminergic neurons can also uh, function at long term after transplantation. Okay, so there are several strategies for cell replacement in Parkinson's disease being tested or planned to be tested. And so just to outline um, why, in our opinion, the autologous approach will be the most efficacious and safe, um, I've listed some of these points here. So as I showed you for the um, primate, uh, non-human primate model, the autologous approach requires no immune suppression in patients. And so we know that competing allogeneic and MHC match cell therapy approaches will require long-term immune suppression uh, for at least six to 12 months. And, uh, but also we know that there are significant immunological effects of the um, effects on the actual uh, transplanted neurons themselves. And so um, ours and other, other people's data suggests that the autologous neural cell transplant transplants are potentially better integrated in the brain um, with good axonal networks and better functional effects than the non-autologous um, transplants. And we also know from experiences with from other modalities of um, using autologous versus allogeneic cell therapy in patients, um, for example, using bone marrow transplantation, um, we can learn from these exper experiences uh, in, in uh, the um, cell replacement paradigms uh, in the brain as well. And we know that, um, for example, with bone marrow transplantation, that morbidity and costs for failed allogeneic transplants are much higher uh, than they are for the autologous transplants. So in our opinion, um, we, we believe that this autologous IPSC approach will be uh, the best to um, pursue, and so that is indeed what we are doing. And so again here, uh, to show you again, here is our approach for using the autologous transplantation. And so um, just to briefly mention again, we take blood from patients, patients with Parkinson's disease, isolate the T cells, reprogram those into induced pluripotent stem cells, um, perform multiple quality control steps, um, uh, differentiate those cells using our differentiation protocol into midbrain dopaminergic neurons, cryopreserve these cells, um, again, perform quality control steps, and eventually these are then implanted into the pertainment of the Parkinson's disease patient. So we have been in communication with the Food and Drug Administration for our cell therapy work for several years. And in October 2018, we had a positive response from the FDA in our pre-IND meeting where they gave us um, essentially approval of our plans for performing work to support an eventual IND. And so now they, as well as um, with our funding from the NIH, basically has given us the go ahead for now taking this program to a systematic analysis of autologous cell therapy in patients with Parkinson's disease. 
And so our NIH award is called a CREATE award. Uh, this will allow us to perform a um, first in man study of autologous midbrain dopaminergic neurons for Parkinson's disease. And so uh, this again is a, is a big um, collaborative team effort. Um, there's four of us as um, PIs on this grant, myself, uh, Ola Isaacson, Teresa Osborne, and um, James Schumacher. Uh, we're here at the Neuroregeneration Institute. We're working with uh, Dana Farber, um, uh, some manipulation core facility to make the cells. We're working with Brigham and Women's Hospital, um, as, as well as a number of uh, CROs. And of course, we have a clinical advisory team um, and um, other collaborators and um, other uh, collaborators. And so here is our timeline. So we're now one year into the start of this um, uh, five-year um, uh, program. And so we will be performing IND, or we are performing IND enabling studies. We'll recruit patients for the cell generation um, in the middle of next year, get our beginning of next year, um, seek our IND approval, um, and then begin our clinical trial over at Brigham and Women's Hospital, where we'll test this autologous transplantation approach in six patients with Parkinson's disease. So we're, um, yeah, we're extremely excited about this work and um, so happy that all this. Um, um, work that that has come before um, uh, that I showed you that has come before this point has really now come to fruition so that we can um, uh, test this autologous transplantation approach in a systematic manner. And so, yeah, that's what I wanted to show you today. Um, so here's our um, CREATE um, NIH award uh, PI team uh, with Dr. Schumacher, Ola, uh, Ola Isaacs and myself and Theresia Osborne. And yeah, as I said at the start, this is really um, decades of work, uh, really led by um, by Dr. Isaacson, but a huge team approach um, from the Neurogeneration Institute, as well as all of our all of our collaborators. Um, so many people that have been involved, um, and so I really want to thank everybody, and of course our, our funding aid, our funding. Um, mechanisms too. Uh, currently we're funded by, as I mentioned, by the NIH for this work with this great bio award. Uh, but uh, before this, we've been funded for, on this program for a number of years from the Michael J. Fox Foundation uh, to to um, go forward um, with this with this cell therapy work, particularly with the primate model work, and then of course um, our longstanding um, philanthropic uh, donors who have really. Um, you know, allowed us to continue this work for a number of years as well and continue, who continue to support us. So thank you very much and be very happy to take any questions. So thank you, Dr. Hallett. That was um, such a such an impressive presentation and um, it's, it's really exciting um, to hear about all the work you've accomplished and uh, you and your team and Dr. Isaacson and everyone else and um, and the hope that it gives people with Parkinson's disease. So if people do have questions, type them into the Q&A box. Um, we'll get through as many of them as we can. We already have several in queue. Um, so uh, I, I know a lot of people listening to this wonder about other conditions. So what are your thoughts or other people's thoughts in this space in terms of strategies of transplantation for other CNS conditions in which neuronal loss or hypofunction might be a, a a problem. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think I think the you know, of course, the this paradigm with Parkinson's disease is it's Parkinson's disease at least for the motor symptoms is really an ideal um, condition to uh, or disease to to test this cell therapy paradigm in because we know we have this um, selective loss of the dopaminergic neurons that we can we can replace. Um, and of course, as we as we test this approach more in the more in the clinic too, then we can, um, as I hope, hopefully conveyed this with this synaptic repair, then we're, re we're really repairing the circuitry. Um, and so within Parkinson's disease, we would um, also test whether we also see improvement in other symptoms of the disease of the of the disease as well, with, as we're replacing this dopamine. Um, uh, restoring the dopaminergic circuitry, but I think, yeah, this um, this really opens the um, 
the door also for using the stem cell based approaches for other disease indications, neurological disease indications as well. So um, for example, Huntington's disease has also been tested with fetal cell transplantation approaches. So this would also be an approach for using the um, stem cell derived neurons but um and then of but of course um you know many of the um i i think really any any neurological or um, psychiatric disorder where we know that there's um dysfunction in these brain circuitries could potentially be used for um uh neuron uh, neuronal uh cell neuronal transplantation approaches and of course not just neuron uh, transplantation approaches to also other non-neural cells glial cells as well Great. And, and so on that, on that exact topic, um, what about like strokes or spinal cord injuries where, um, especially with spinal cord injuries, where the, the neurons would need to grow over very long distances, um, you know, if there's any work occurring in that space? Uh, yes, there is work um, occurring in that space. Um, of course, the, again, the nice thing with the Parkinson's disease approaches, but as I showed you, because the dopaminergic neurons um, project up to the stratum, it, it allows us to actually put the the um, those implanted cells directly in the spot where they um, can hook up and with their normal with the normal neurons that they would um, connect with. And so, I think for the spinal cord repair, yeah, that's that's a bigger challenge because, like you say, you do have much longer distances to uh, distances to grow. Yeah. How invasive or risky is the process of the transplantation into the putamen? Well, so it's really no more risky than what is being widely used right now for deep brain stimulation. So um, it's the the main risk is just is actually just from introducing the needle into the or in the case of DBS in, introducing the electrode into the brain, um, and so it's a very it's uh, you know and so any any kind of introduction like that into the brain of course ca always carries a risk of a bleeding risk but it's a very very small percentage one to two percent of um, of uh, patients and so um, it's a it's a small risk but it's no more risky than other uh, more f uh, other frequently used um, parad therapeutic paradigms such as the deep brain stimulation. Great. And um, I, another question, and you alluded to this a little bit ago in terms of just kind of other um, conditions, but with Parkinson's disease, we know that there are some very common comorbid conditions that go along with Parkinson's disease on top of the motor symptoms. So cognitive impairment, psychotic symptoms even, possibly just due to the dopamine treatment itself. But, um, you know, mood disorders, um, all sorts of uh, psychiatric comorbidities are common. And do we know anything, even in, in some of the longer term patients that you described, like that got the fetal cells over 10 years ago, do we know anything about whether these transplantations are having an impact on those comorbid symptoms? Yeah, I mean, as I, I as I mentioned, the the because we are replacing the the circuitry in a way, then we would might well expect that we would see improvement in some of those symptoms. Of course, with the because we can take away when the transplantation works well, the patients can come off their dopaminergic therapies or or really reduce the amount of dopaminergic pharmacological therapies that they've been given, and so that itself can then reduce those um, 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 indications that are associated with taking um, um, long-term dopaminergic therapy. So that that will get Im that will get improved. But I think, yeah, as a, again, as we learn more about the um, this cell therapy paradigm and, and in particularly with using the autologous approach as well in that we can then generate potentially in the future generate other types of um, neuronal, neuronal glial cells as well that can be um, could be used as a, as cell replacement for, uh, in other parts of the brain um, that could potentially uh, restore some of the um, the cognitive features that are not associated with the with the dopaminergic cell therapy, but yeah, I, I think as these clinical trials, I mean, with the with the uh, with the fetal cell transplantation, um, you know, there's a number of patients who have been who have been transplanted, but this is work that's um, really 
spanned over a couple of decades now. And so I'm not sure that some of these things have really been have been um, rigorously followed in the patients. Um, uh, there is a, st- uh, uh, there was a um, bigger study uh, called TransEuro that's just ha- been has been occurring in in Europe over the past uh, five to ten years that has been kind of more systematically ch- testing the fetal cell transplantation approach. So it will be interesting to see what data come from that study. Um, but I think as our group and other groups really now. Um, kind of at the same time as starting to test this stem cell derived transplantation approach. These are all answers that we'll get the, that we'll get the questions to. Great. Um, does that, so one person specifically asked about Lewy body dementia and, um, you know, assuming that maybe whatever the pathological process of Parkinson's disease is, is not only affecting these dopaminergic neurons, but maybe affecting other neurons in a different way, resulting in Lewy bodies and um, eventually Lewy body dementia. And since you're speci- since you're specifically replacing just one cell type in one location, do we know if that replacement has any effect on kind of the the accumulation of Lewy bodies in other parts of the brain? Like, is the is the pathology of Parkinson's disease still going on? Um, and affecting other parts of the brain, even though you've replaced these, you know, dead neurons. Yeah. So the yeah. So the underlying disease process is still is is still going on. And so for for you know, and that's another part of what we're working on. <laughs> the story of what we're working on in the Neuroregeneration Institute is really to identify those presynapses pre-symptomatic um, changes um, in that curve I showed you of the this whole time period before we get to where the majority of the dopaminergic neurons are lost and really try to understand the changes that are happening in, in neurons in glia in the brain, um, in not just in the substantia nigra dopaminergic neurons, but those in in Lewy body dementia, in the in the cortex, in the hippocampus, what is happening to those cells, um, so that they are, when they also become affected by the by the disease process. And so, as we learn more about that, then we can, um, you know, hopefully then um, apply neuroprotective treatments so that we never actually get to that um, stage where the cells become too affected by the disease process. Great. Yeah, no. So I, I'm just mindful of the time and I want to be respectful of your time. So I just want to thank you so much for thank a you. really wonderful presentation and for sharing this really exciting research with us. And uh, I want to thank everybody for attending. And um, so thanks a lot. Thank you very much.